Tonight, the one-time NFL legend at the center of what many have called the trial of the century, O.J. Simpson, is dead at 76. The football Hall of Famer who became a Hollywood star only to be charged in 1994 with the brutal murders of his ex-wife Nicole Brown and her friend Ron Goldman. The drama all playing out on live TV, the white Bronco chase. Simpson's arrest, the trial, the gloves, and ultimately that not guilty verdict. Simpson's family revealing today he died of cancer. What they're saying about his final moments and the reaction from the Goldman family. Also tonight, the battle over Arizona's near total abortion ban. The aggressive new push by President Biden to pin blame on former President Trump, who takes credit for the overturning of Roe v. Wade. The tornado touching down in Florida, leaving a trail of damage, high water rescues as heavy rain moves up the East Coast. Shohei Otani's former interpreter charged with bank fraud and the staggering amount the feds say he stole. $16 million from the MLB superstar. How he allegedly did it. And our NBC News exclusive, nearly a year after he was shot in the head when he rang the wrong doorbell, Ralph Yarl speaking out. The mental trauma he now lives with and would he ever forgive the man who shot him. This is NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good evening and welcome. The news breaking today that O.J. Simpson has died no doubt stirred vivid memories for many Americans who were captivated by a seemingly irresistible saga during the 1990s. The unlikely story of a charming, intelligent football star turned actor and pitchman who was accused in the vicious 1994 murders of his ex-wife and her friend and was later acquitted in perhaps the most sensational and closely followed criminal trial of the last century. The not guilty verdict left the country sharply divided. Terms like white bronco, if it doesn't fit, slow speed chase, all became memes before there was such a thing. Simpson's family announcing his death today coming after a battle with cancer. Tonight, in death as in life, the name O.J. Simpson evoking sharp reactions. Cynthia McFadden reports. The trial of the century and the death today of the man at its center, O.J. Simpson, brings back the long legacy of a trial that concluded nearly 30 years ago. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder. That not guilty verdict in the brutal murders of his former wife and mother of his two children, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her friend, Ronald Goldman, reverberated around the country met by outrage by many who believed he was guilty and that there was a mountain of evidence that proved it. This prosecution team didn't lose today. I deeply believe that this country lost today. Justice was not served. <laughs> While many in black America cheered what they saw as justice, so often denied in their community, finally done. The nation had been captivated just five days after the murders on a Friday night when 95 million TV viewers watched as Simpson in a white Bronco, driven by a former teammate, led officers on an hours-long low-speed chase, reportedly holding a gun to his own head. He has been charged with two counts of homicide. Finally, he surrendered to police. Within months, Simpson went to trial, which was broadcast daily. Much of the public following each day's testimony, judging the evidence in the eight-month trial for themselves. Now that I did not, could not, and would not have committed this crime. The trial highlighted many of the fractures in the country's legal system, bringing together celebrity, race, and the power of money. The defense team, dubbed the Dream Team, was made up of super lawyers who were able to both undermine the state scientific evidence. All right, would you show that to the jury, Mr. Simpson, and the men? While also capturing the jury's attention with their mastery of courtroom theatrics. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. And the jury did acquit. A man who, until the trial, had led what appeared to be an accomplished life. He rose from poverty, becoming one of the greatest football players to ever play the game. A college star at USC, Heisman Trophy winner, and a record-setting player with the Buffalo Bills, who became known as the Juice. He went on to star in commercials. Nobody does it better than her. And television and movies. 
And while he was acquitted of murder, his life afterwards spiraled downwards. In a civil lawsuit, he was ordered to pay over $33 million to the victims' families, most of that debt left unpaid. He returned to court multiple times over the next several years for traffic violations, even pirating cable TV. But it was a Las Vegas robbery in 2008. Simpson said he was taking back personal stolen property that ultimately sent him to prison. Count one, conspiracy to commit a crime. Guilty. Count he served nine years. He died yesterday at 76 from cancer. His family said he was surrounded by his children and grandchildren. Fred Goldman, Ron Goldman's father, did not mince words. It's no great loss to the world. It's a further reminder of Ron's being gone. And Cynthia O.J. Simpson would often say the jury found him innocent. Well, that's right, Lester, but our justice system, the jury doesn't decide innocence. They found him not guilty, and that is something different. An acquittal, at least in this case, became part of his own prison as the downward spiral of his life afterwards attests. All right, Cynthia, thank you. And for more, tune in to Dateline, The People versus O.J. Simpson, tonight at 11 p.m. Eastern, streaming on News Now. We turn out of the escalating battle over abortion. The Biden campaign counting on the Arizona court ruling on that sweeping Civil War era abortion ban to give them an edge, while former President Trump is also speaking out. Here's Hallie Jackson. A new aggressive push tonight from the president. If Donald Trump gets back in power, what freedom will you lose next? A new ad blitz pinning the blame on his predecessor for Arizona's controversial abortion ban. Your body and your decisions belong to you, not the government, not Donald Trump. I will fight like hell to get your freedom back. On the Arizona ruling that reinstates an 1864 law banning nearly all abortions, with the exception of those to save the mother's life, the Biden campaign's looking to put Republicans on defense. As Mr. Trump acknowledges, overnight Democrats have the political advantage. The only issue they have, the only issue they think they have is on abortion. And now all I say is the states are handling it. The former president accusing Democrats of trying to distract from the economy and immigration, both consistently the most important issue for voters, with polls showing Americans prefer Mr. Trump to President Biden by about 20 points on the economy, 30 points on the border. Even though Mr. Trump opposes the Arizona abortion ban and a national ban, he's also taking credit for the overturning of Roe versus Wade, a decision which paved the way for very restrictive, broadly unpopular abortion limits. He and other Republicans now trying to thread the needle, including Arizona's Carrie Lake. A full ban on abortion is not where the people are. The issue is less about banning abortion and more about saving babies. For the ban's opponents in Arizona, anger turning to action. You say you're ready to do whatever it takes to get the ban repealed, but how? I immediately called for the repeal of this ban, uh, and I'm going to continue to do that. I think a lot of Republicans are seeing that this is going to hurt them in the election. And state lawmakers could pass a repeal as early as next week before the ban's set to go into effect later this spring. Lester. Allie Jackson, thanks. We're tracking severe storms moving up the East Coast tonight after producing a confirmed tornado today in northern Florida. Powerful winds tearing through this backyard, whipping around lawn furniture and debris. First responders using boats to rescue stranded residents. Those storms moving north, causing flooding in Charleston and Savannah. Let's turn now to our exclusive reporting on a potential terror threat here at home involving a man on the terror watch list who crossed the southern border but was arrested, then released into the U.S., and he is not the only one. Here's Julia Ainsley. Tonight, an alarming development in the border crisis. Among the record number of migrants crossing the southern border was a member of an Afghan terror organization who was released into the U.S. by border agents, according to U.S. officials. 48-year-old Mohammed Harwin illegally crossed into California in March of last year. His name is on a U.S. terror watch list, identifying him as a member of HIG, a terror group that's killed Americans in Afghanistan. Border agents suspected he was on the watch list at the time of his apprehension, but lacked corroborating information, according to U.S. officials. CBP released him without contacting the FBI or Immigration and Customs Enforcement, those officials told us. Harwin was allowed to apply for work authorization and board planes in the U.S., according to those officials. 
After almost a year, ICE arrested him here in San Antonio. But when he went to court, U.S. officials tell us, ICE officials withheld classified information about his terrorism ties. A judge ordered him released on $12,000 bond, which he posted and was freed last month. Harwin's case appears to be just one of at least three incidents in the past two years involving suspected terrorists being released by Customs and Border Protection, according to the DHS Inspector General and Congress. It comes as President Biden faces fierce criticism of his handling of the border crisis, including from former President Trump. Many terrorists, many drug dealers at the highest level, they're all coming into our country. The percentage of people on the terror watch list apprehended at U.S. borders is a small fraction of all migrants encountered. Point 0.02 percent under President Biden, 0.05 percent during the Trump administration. Any terrorist or terrorist-linked individual trying to come into this country is unacceptable. We pressed a former top ICE official in the Biden administration about how a member of a terror group could be released into the U.S. by DHS. This is very, very rare. Um, there's a, a large capacity and capability for both Border Patrol, ICE, federal law enforcement and the interagency to identify, vet these individuals as they come to the border. But there are fears about tens of thousands of migrants now evading agents as they cross the southern border. The Border Patrol chief recently calling it a national security threat. And the FBI director warning about smugglers with ties to ISIS. There is a particular network um, that uh, has uh, where some of the overseas facilitators of the smuggling network have ISIS ties. Uh, that we're very concerned about. Julia, the Department of Homeland Security has just responded to us about this case. Lester, they say they can't comment on ongoing matters, but are taking all necessary steps to ensure public safety. They say if someone has entered the country and is later found to be associated with a potential national security concern, they will, quote, take appropriate action. Tonight, Harwin remains undetained, potentially somewhere in the U.S. Lester. Julia Ainsley, thank you. Kansas City Chief Star Rashi Rice has a warrant out for his arrest after a high-speed car crash in Dallas. But when and where he may turn himself in is not clear. We get more from Priscilla Thompson. NFL wide receiver Rashi Rice has surrendered to police on eight felony charges. Just 24 hours after an arrest warrant was issued for him tied to this high-speed crash on a Dallas Expressway last month. Rice admitted he was behind the wheel of one of the speeding cars that police say caused the six-vehicle crash. The Super Bowl champ and another driver are charged with aggravated assault, collision involving serious bodily injury, and six counts of collision involving injury. Altogether, punishable by up to 35 years in prison and up to $25,000 in fines if convicted. He's a young man that made a mistake. Rice and his attorney have said they are cooperating with authorities and that Rice takes full responsibility for his actions, which police say injured four people. You guys all right? You guys just going to leave it? The warrants come nearly two weeks after the dangerous crash in which the NFL star left the scene, investigators say. Dallas police chief said in a statement that the investigation was thorough and fair. Meanwhile, the NFL says it is continuing to monitor all developments. We are just learning that Rice has been taken into custody and is expected to bond out soon. Lester. Priscilla Thompson, thank you. In 60 seconds, the charge filed against Shohei Otani's former interpreter and the staggering amount of money he's now accused of stealing from the baseball superstar. That's right after this. Federal prosecutors today announced the former interpreter for Los Angeles Dodgers superstar Shohei Otani is being charged with bank fraud. Here's Liz Kreitz. Tonight, federal authorities charging Shohei Otani's former translator, Ipe Misuhara, with bank fraud, alleging he stole $16 million from the baseball superstar. Mr. Misuhara did all this to feed his insatiable appetite for illegal sports betting. Prosecutors say Misuhara, who they describe as Otani's de facto manager, made 19,000 bets with an illegal bookmaker. He used a bank account of Otani's, which he helped Otani set up and had access to. At times, he even impersonated Otani to get the wire transfers approved. Mr. Mitsuhara used and abused that position of trust in order to take advantage of Mr. Otani. While they found no evidence he bet on baseball, authorities say Misuhara racked up more than $40 million in gambling debt between 2021 and 2024. Text messages obtained by prosecutors show him admitting to a bookie he stole from Otani, saying, it's all over for me. 
The Dodgers star recently telling reporters through a new translator that he was duped by his friend. I'm very saddened and shocked that someone who I'm trusted has done this. Authorities saying there is no evidence Otani was aware of Ms. Uhara's actions. Mr. Otani is considered a victim in this case. And no comment today from Otani, the Dodgers, or Ms. Uhara, who prosecutors say will have his first court appearance here in Los Angeles tomorrow. If convicted, he faces up to 30 years in prison. Buster. Liz Kreutz, thank you. Up next, teens being extorted via social media over explicit images. What Mark Zuckerberg's meta says it's doing to protect them. Facing pressure from families and lawmakers, Meta today announcing it's testing new features to prevent the sexual extortion of children. Savannah Sellers got an exclusive look at how they'll work in our series, Kids Under Pressure. After mounting criticism that platforms aren't doing enough to protect young users from sexual exploitation, tonight Meta announcing it's testing new tools for Instagram to prevent sextortion or coercing someone into sharing an intimate photo, then blackmailing them to keep it private. Antigone Davis is Meta's global head of safety. We will be using technology and signals to identify potentially suspicious sextortion accounts and try to prevent them from messaging with minors. We're focused on intimate images. She gave us an exclusive look at how it would work. If a user receives a nude image, it would be blurred at first. They'll also get this message. Don't feel pressure to respond. The sender will be prompted to reconsider and given an option to unsend. This tool automatically turned on for users under 18. They'll also direct users to a service called Take It Down, which helps minors remove intimate images of themselves online. The announcement comes after this stunning moment with Mark Zuckerberg on Capitol Hill. The whole thing is a dog and pony show. Mary Rohde was there. She says just hours after her son Riley was a victim of sexploitation on Facebook, he took his own life. I think it's a PR stunt all around to make parents think that their kids are safe on Meta. Overall, none of this is a tool that would have saved Riley or the next child. Why should parents believe that you care more about their child than Meta's bottom line? Well, I guess what I'd want parents to know is that I'm that I'm a parent. We care deeply about providing a safe, age-appropriate, positive experience. I also want them to know, even if they have lingering doubts, is that it's not in our business interest for teens or anybody else to have an unsafe experience on our platform. Even if in your business interest is to have more users? Yeah. A bad experience will make people leave our platform. The tool isn't available to users yet, but Meta says they're working towards that. Savannah Sellers, NBC News, Washington. And up next, we'll speak exclusively with Ralph Yarl, the teen who was shot Whatever. when he rang the wrong doorbell. His important message coming up. Finally, our NBC News exclusive. Nearly a year after Ralph Yarl, a teen from Kansas City, was shot when he rang the wrong doorbell, Antonia Hilton spoke with him and his family and friends about the trauma he is still coming to grips with. One year ago, Ralph Yarl was just 16 years old. He loved nature walks with family, jumping on trampolines, and playing in his high school band. That was Ralph before April 13th, 2023. This is Ralph now. I try to keep like a sort of sense of normalcy so that I can continue being the person that I am and that I used to be. Forever changed when he rang the doorbell of the wrong home while trying to pick up his twin brothers. And 85-year-old Andrew Lester shot him twice in the head and arm. Ralph's survival deemed a miracle. Would you say it's been harder to physically recover or mentally recover? Definitely mentally, but it's a constant uphill battle. Ralph suffered splitting headaches. Always an A student, he now struggles to study. In the last few months, he crashed his car twice. His mother and aunt say sometimes he can't sleep. Other times, he sleeps too much. When you have trauma, initially there's the shock of all of it, but then when everything starts to simmer, and then you start to realize how life is not what it used to be. Ralph and his friends are struggling to process three shootings in their hometown over the last year. Ralph's a classmate's killing and the Kansas City Chiefs parade shooting. It's like a constant nagging of watch your surroundings. Going to houses and stuff, I'm like, this is the right address. I can't get this wrong. 
In October, Andrew Lester, who has pled not guilty and told police he was scared to death, will stand trial for Ralph's shooting. Mr. Lester is currently comfortable, enjoying his old age. Ralph hasn't even considered forgiving the man, who in an instant brought his childhood to an end. Has he ever asked for your forgiveness? The family speaking out to remind the country, we can't forget, we can't become desensitized. We are tired of people saying that you are in my thoughts and prayers. We need to get out of your thoughts and your prayers and get into your actions. If not for their sake, they say, for the next child harmed by gun violence in America. Antonia Hilton, NBC News, Kansas City. That's nightly news for this Thursday. Thank you for watching. I'm Lester Holt. Please take care of yourself and each other. Good night. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.